Okay, so welcome to our New Horizons small group. We are using the Explore the Bible curriculum. We're in John chapter 12, and we're looking at this quarter, John 12 through 21. So Explore the Bible curriculum, John 12 through 21. This is session number two, and we're in the second half of John 12, beginning at verse 20. And the session titled is, If It Dies. So session two, If It Dies, John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20. So this morning, as we were getting ready to leave the house to come to church, as we pulled out of our driveway, looked over to the right, one of Vivian's flower beds, and some of her flowers were already that high and some of them were already beginning to show some color so the flowers were beginning to bloom she assures me they are cool weather flowers because it's still cool out there to me but it's starting to get to be spring and when spring comes spring planting how many of you plant a garden or work on a flower bed during the spring Anybody? Yeah, reluctantly. reluctantly? Okay. <laughs> when we first moved to North, up here in, in the Liberty area where we lived, lived, we a number of times tried to have tomato plants. And we would have potted tomato plants. So we'd have this big pot and we would plant some tomato plants. Well, the problem was we had some of the most beautiful plants you have ever seen. Didn't have much luck with tomatoes. Beautiful plants, no tomatoes. Or if they were tomatoes, they'd have bite marks on them where some critter got it. And this was sitting on our balcony as well. Didn't work. Our neighbor two doors down, they plant a little garden behind their house. Strawberries, tomatoes, a few other plants. And they have luscious stuff. I don't know what they do that we don't, but they have much better luck with their little garden than we ever had with our potted tomato plants. But have you ever thought about where the tomato plants come from? Most of the time when we buy tomato plants, you in fact buy tomato plants. We don't buy seeds. Now, a lot of times when we look at flowers for flower beds or some other plants, we get seeds. But if you looked at the seed and didn't know what it was, would you know what the plant was? No. I realize that the package shows you, thank goodness, because if you looked at the seed, I doubt any of us could figure out what it was. If I looked at a tomato seed, it'd be just a seed to me. Certain, certain seeds are a little bit more like watermelon seed or okay. chicken seed or something. Watermelon seed, I could probably <laughs> tell because I've, I've spit enough of those out. Yeah. I could probably tell a watermelon seed. Sunflower seed. Sunflower seed, maybe. But for most seeds that you would plant to get flowers or veggies of some type, I doubt if I could tell the difference. Isn't there an ant? There probably is. She said, is there an app for that? There probably is. It's not worth it. But in today's session, Jesus is going to use the analogy of a seed being planted to talk about his crucifixion and resurrection. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's where we are today. Last week, we were at the first part of chapter 12, and we talked about Jesus' anointing at Bethany at the banquet in his honor is anointing by Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. If you're looking at chapter 12 in your Bibles, the first 11 verses deal with the anointing and the results of that anointing being that the Sanhedrin decided that not only did Jesus but Lazarus both had to die because people were beginning to follow Jesus in many cases because of raising Lazarus. And therefore, they were not following 
the Pharisees, the religious leaders. So the decision was made that they both had to die, and they put the word out that if you knew where Jesus was, come tell us. Well, beginning at verse 12 and running down through verse 19, the Pharisees did not have to worry about where Jesus was because he came down from Bethany and entered Jerusalem in what we know as Palm Sunday or the uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, I handed out this morning a little sheet. There are two things on it if you haven't looked. It's front and back. The front is a smaller version of what's on the board over there. Yeah, there are some other extras up here. So it's a smaller version of what's over on the wall here in the bigger version. Kind of shows you the events of Passion Week and where they took place in Jerusalem. And then on the back is kind of a day-to-day -day listing of what happened during Passion Week. So from the triumphal entry on Sunday to Jesus rising from the dead on the next Sunday. And this is a compilation of all of the, uh, the Gospels. Now, John's Gospel has a limited amount of information on what happened during Passion Week. John was more interested, as we're going to find over the next few weeks, in Jesus' farewell discourses with the disciples, which we'll start with today, where he talks about what's going to happen to him and prepares them for their mission of the beginning of the church. So beginning at verse 20, we start with um, his probably last teaching in the temple precincts. And this is where he's going to talk about, number one, his crucifixion. And then towards the end of the chapter, he talks about how he has fulfilled the prophecies from Isaiah. And then the end of the chapter is kind of a summary that John puts in. That summarizes Jesus' mission. It's Jesus talking, but it's the summary of his mission. And then next week, we pick up chapter 13, and we'll talk about uh, the Passover supper, what we call the Lord's <laughs> Supper that followed, and then we'll go on for several chapters through about chapter 17, looking at Jesus' um, farewell discourses, his teachings to the disciples. This is what's going to happen. This is what you need to be concerned about. This is what you're charged to do. So several weeks hereafter, we'll be talking about that. So today, let's look at Jesus' final prediction on what's going to happen to him, beginning at verse 20 in chapter 12. So verses 20 through 22. Uh, Janice, could you read those, please? 20 to 22. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Okay. So Jesus has entered the, the city in what we call Palm Sunday on um, Sunday morning. Uh, he's entered the temple complex. We believe that he is teaching in the temple complex. And there is this group of Greeks, it says. Verse 20 says, Now some Greeks were among those who went to worship at the festival. Well, the festival is Passover. Because we know that when you get to the Lord's Supper, prior to the Lord's Supper being instituted, Jesus and the disciples uh, eat the Passover meal. So the festival they're talking about here is the festival of Passover. Now it says the Greeks came. <coughs> when we look at the context of this, it doesn't mean necessarily, probably doesn't mean, that these were people from Greece. <coughs> it refers to people who have a Greek background, Greek culture, uh, maybe speak the Greek language, if you happen to have your map from first session, not this map, but the map of um, Israel that I handed out at the beginning of the last session when we had the outline, if you look up at the top of it, 
of the uh, Sea of Galilee, up the Jordan River, up at the very top, you'll see Capernaum. And Capernaum was an area called the Decapolis, which means literally the Ten Cities. That was a Greek cultural area. So the supposition, the assumption is that these were probably Greek-speaking, Greek-culturally uh, geared people who came from that area down to Jerusalem for the festival. If they came for the festival, that means they were either God-fearers. God-fearers mean that they had accepted some of the Jewish uh, faith tenets. Or more likely, these were actually converts to Judaism. So they were to be welcome in the temple as a place to go worship. And verse 21 says, As I came to Philip, who was bum, bus, and top. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Again, Bethsaida is up in that Decapolis area. And the commentator makes a note that the name Philip actually has some Greek origins. So possibly the reason they came directly to Philip and not one of the other disciples was because he was from their same area and he had a Greek sounding name. Probably didn't know it. If you look at verse 21, they address him as sir, which is a very polite form of address. Probably means they did not know who he was personally, but they recognized his name as being Greek and they recognized that he was from Bethsaida and therefore they felt comfortable approaching somebody that lived in the same area that they did. And the request is that we want to see Jesus. Apostle John does not tell us what they wanted to see Jesus about. They just said we want to see Jesus. It doesn't actually even tell us whether or not they saw him or not. Notice in verse 22, Philip gets the request. Philip then goes and tells Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Philip and Andrew do not appear very often by name doing anything in the Gospels. When you look at their names appearing, it's usually in a list of the disciples. When their names are listed, it's generally in the process of bringing someone to Christ. So if you remember when Jesus first called the disciples, Andrew's first thing was he went and called his brother Peter. With Philip, the first thing he did was went and called um, Bartholomew, I think it was. He went and called one of the other disciples to be a disciple. So, no, Nathaniel, I think, is who it was. But they both went and called somebody. And that's what they're known for, as being people who brought other people to Jesus. And so in this case, they've gone to Jesus and said, there's some Greeks that want to see you. Notice in verse 23, though, that we're picking up next, Jesus does not indicate that he's seen them. He doesn't talk about what he said with them. John just simply says, Jesus is going to say this. Total change of subject, if you will. So let's look at 23 through 26. Uh, O'Coin, could you read 23 to 26 at a, the quarterly there, if you would? And he took his right now or pound for the son of man, and he is glorified. They who have told you are less proud of me fall to the ground and die in the name of the ascendancy. But they can die and produce many things. Anyone who loves their life will lose them. While anyone who fears their life in this world will keep it for what is on life. You will for serve me, you must follow me, and where I am, my, ser my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Okay. Verse 23 is like a total different picture. Uh, Philip and Andrew have gone and said there's some Greeks that want to talk to you. We don't know what they wanted. We don't know if they had a chance to talk to Jesus. Jesus begins telling a parable. Verse 23, And the holman says, Jesus replied to them, them being 
probably Philip and Andrew, and probably the crowd around him. Because again, at this point, he's in the temple teaching in public, remembering that the Sanhedrin is wanting to arrest him. But there's a crowd around him, so they're not about to cause a riot. So Jesus is teaching. And he starts off by saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, if you think back over the last 11 chapters that we've looked at, there were several places where Jesus says, My hour has not come. If you think back to about the second or third session we had in the last quarter, he's at the wedding in Cana. And his mother comes and asks him to assist in the fact that they've run out of wine. And if you remember, his answer was, Well, when my hour has not come. And there are several other places where Jesus has said, My hour has not come. It's not time literally, for me to be crucified. Well, here in verse 23, he says, the hour has come. Jesus knows that he's basically in the last week of his life. The hour has come. And then this says, for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, the Son of Man is used in all four Gospels to identify Jesus by himself. Didn't realize this. I'd always thought somebody else called him that. But from the commentary, the only person who identified him as the Son of Man was Jesus himself. There's one other instance where somebody besides Jesus calls him that. And that's when a mob says, are you the Son of Man? So it's sarcastic. Again, remember that the Son of Man refers back to the vision that Daniel had, which is basically a reference to the Messiah. But Son of Man doesn't have the political connotations that Messiah had for the Jewish people. So, time for the Son of Man to be glorified. And, and John, anytime he talks about the glorification of Jesus, he's talking about one thing. Death, burial, and resurrection. In John's Gospel, anytime he talks about Jesus being glorified, it's a reference to his death, burial, and resurrection. As we go through the next few chapters, that word's going to be used a lot. So just keep that in the back of your head. Anytime he talks about the Son of Man being glorified, or the Son being glorified, it's a reference to his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 24, here comes that parable. 24 says, I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. Israel was an agrarian society. So people would understand the imagery of planting a seed and getting a crop. When we plant seeds, we hope to get a crop too. Remember my tomato plants? We wanted tomatoes. Didn't work, but we wanted tomatoes. Our neighbors down the way planted. They got strawberries and they shared them with the neighbors. They got tomatoes and other things and they shared. You, you're looking for a crop when you plant a seed. The example he uses is wheat. Well, you're planting your wheat seeds and you hope you're going to get a big field of wheat. Because for them, that would be where they got their flour and got their bread for the future. Planting it, the symbology here is that it dies, planted in the ground. And then it comes back up with an abundance. What nobody is getting is this is the symbolism that Christ is using for himself. Because he's going to be planted in the ground. After his death, he's placed in a cave tomb. But with his resurrection, he gets a, my words, bumper crop of believers. So the imagery here is that in order for God's kingdom to grow, Christ needed to die as the sacrifice for the sins of humanity so that they could then at his resurrection be the um, be justified before God. Uh, again, if you think back over in some of Apostle Paul's writings, 
he talks about Christ being the first fruits. So was planted and rose and now because of that and our belief in him, we also are resurrected and therefore that's the bumper crop, my words, that we're talking about. Verse 25 says, the one who loves his life will lose it. The one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We're not, when we says here, the one who hates his life, we're not necessarily talking about literally you got to hate your life. I mean, some of us may hate the life we got, okay? But we're not really talking about you got to hate your life. You can have a good life. The contrast they're sitting up here, or John is sitting up here, is between loving your life and hating your life. We should love our lives, and he's talking here about our life in God, or our love for God, more so than we love our own lives. The one who loves his life, parentheses you can put in, more than he loves God, will lose it. And the one who hates his life will keep it for eternal life. So our love for God, love for his son, is what allows us to have that eternal life that John talks about throughout his gospel. 26 says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. He's making a transition. If you love me, you're going to follow me. Now, a couple of sessions on from now, he's going to come back to this in the farewell discourses and talk about loving me, obeying my commandments, is service to me. So a couple of weeks, we're going to go into this more detail. But in here, he's only talking to the crowd. Later, he's going to be talking much more extensively to the disciples. Same subject. That's coming. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, my servant also will be. If you are a servant to somebody, you're where that person is. You're doing what that person wants you to do. Again, a couple more chapters. He's going to be much more detailed when he talks to the disciples individual, or in a group by themselves. The Father will honor him. So if you obey my commands, if you love me, if you love God more than you love life, then you're going to be honored by God. So 27 and 28. Dean? Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then the voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. Okay. 27 says, Now my life is troubled. The word troubled here is the same word, that is used for Jesus at Lazarus' tomb. And I just remind you, it simply means uh, a strong emotional reaction to something. Jesus knew what he was going to face. You know, again, we've talked a number of times. During this time, Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And that's going to play out throughout the next three or four chapters. Because his humanity is going to show through as well as his divinity. So my soul is troubled. I'm having a human emotion. I'm facing a very anxious next three or four days. It's an emotional turmoil time for me. That's the human side. And then he says, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. It's a rhetorical question. Commentator again makes a really good point. This is not any way in the world saying that there is any doubt about what's going to happen. If you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, which John doesn't talk about in his gospel, the other uh, three gospels do, Jesus prays, Father, take this cup from me. Again, it's a rhetorical question. He knows what he's going to face, but he knows that this was the plan from the beginning. It's not, um, it's a rhetorical question. And then he goes on to say, but that is why I came to this hour. 
I'm not changing anything. This was the plan from the beginning between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what we came up with. This is what's going to happen. And then 28 says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I will glorify it, and I will glorify it again. This is one of only three times in the Gospels where God audibly speaks to Jesus where other people could hear it. Okay, Bible trivia. This is one. What's the other two? Baptism in the Jordan. Baptism in the Jordan was first. Anybody else? Mount of Transfiguration. Mount Transfiguration. So, at the baptism... There was a crowd around. If you remember, the dove comes down, and this is my beloved son, and who am I all pleased? At the transfiguration, there were only three of the disciples present. But again, audible voice says, this is my son, hear him. Here, audible voice says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Referring to the name of God, and basically, remember, names back here were a basis for reputation. So it's not just the name of God that's going to be glorified, but God's reputation is going to be glorified. Okay, 29 through 33. Bill, would you read those? Proud, the, the crowd standing there heard it and said, was it, was it thunder? Others said that an angel had heard. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus responded, This voice came not for me, not for me, but for you. Now this now now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of the world will cast will be cast out. As for me, I am lifted up from the earth. I will draw all my people to myself. He said this to signify what kind of death he was about. Okay. Verse 29 says, The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Let's face it. If you were standing in the temple listening to Jesus teach, you probably were not expecting to hear the audible voice of God. I mean, really? Um, so it was to be understood that the people standing around mistook it for something else. The uh, word that is translated as voice in 28 can also be translated as the word sound. So they heard something. And some people said, oh, it's thunder. And others thought it was an angel that spoke, but they didn't understand what was said. And verse 30 says, this voice came not for me, but for you. It wasn't a validation of Jesus and his mission. It was something to tell the crowd that God, in fact, validates Jesus. And in fact, if you think back about it for a minute, in the event that we had with Lazarus' death, if you'll remember, Jesus prayed. And in that prayer, he talks about what's happening is not for me, it's for you. We want you to know. In that case, that was his seventh sign, I think it was, from John, that this is the Christ. It was a way of identifying that Jesus was in fact divine. Well here, it's not for me. I know what my mission is. I know my relationship in the Trinity. This is for you to know that I am in fact divine. 31 says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Again, think back to last session, or last quarter, Jesus with Nicodemus. If you remember in Jesus' discourse with Nicodemus, Apostle John records that Jesus said, I came not into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. 
Here it says, this is the judgment of the world. It's not Jesus judging the world. What judges the world and what's being referred to here is the judgment is based on what you're going to do with Jesus. Your own decision is what judges. Ruler of this world is cast out. If you think about Friday, Friday after Jesus died on the cross, devils won. That's what you would think. Satan has won. Son of God is dead, buried, we can forget about him. That's what the Sanhedrin thought. He's dead, gone, forget him. But instead, he rose. The cross was not... Okay, I'm putting my own stuff in here. The cross was not a symbol of defeat. When you look back up in 28 and it says, I will glorify my name, the cross was a symbol of Jesus' glorification. It was him completing the mission that the Trinity had decided on from the beginning of the world. Go back to John 1. From the beginning of the world, this was, as Levi said earlier, this was plan A. Thirty-two says, As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Again, think back to Nicodemus. Jesus told Nicodemus that in order for me to draw people to me, I have to be lifted up like the bronze serpent in the desert in Moses' time. And if there was any doubt as to what he was referring to, John says, 33, signify the type of death I'm going to die. He wants to make sure the reader doesn't miss it. And in order for Jesus to fulfill his mission, to be glorified, to draw others to him, as it says at the end of chapter 11, to grow, to draw all of the scattered people of God together, Jesus had to complete the plan. And that plan was for him to die as the sacrifice. And then picking up there for the next few verses, Jesus talks about being the light of the world. And then he talks about in 37 through 43, how he has fulfilled all the prophecies of Isaiah, which is loaded with messianic prophecies, and Jesus fulfilled them all. And then he summarizes his mission from 44 to the end of the chapter. Not everyone understood, and in fact, people today, not everyone understands what the cross means. In, as Paul talks about in many of his letters, many, many people will reject the cross as a stumbling block. They cannot understand how God can die. For believers, though, who are drawn through the Holy Spirit to faith in Christ, it is the scene of glorification. It is Him completing the mission that was set in place at the beginning of the world. Next week in chapter 13, we get to the Passover. So we're jumping basically from Monday to Thursday. John doesn't address all the stuff that goes in between. Some of the other gospel writers do. But... John doesn't address it. And then in chapter 3, 13, we pick up with the Passover dinner. But again, John does not address the Lord's Supper. And we'll talk some about uh, what the other Gospels say about the Lord's Supper. We'll also talk about uh, the new commandment that he is going to give at the end of chapter 13 in the beginning of 14 as he begins his uh, farewell discourse to the disciples. So, Anybody? Comments? Questions? Something that struck you? Yeah, I, th I thought it was interesting when Le Levi was uh, speaking this morning. I had never thought about this, and I didn't know this happened. But when they when they raised their nets, and they caught all these fish, mm -hmm. and they took them to shore, apparently, or whatever, and, and weeded out the bad ones and saved the good ones. 
and I really never had put that in perspective perspective about the saved and unsaved. Mm -hmm. God, Jesus said he would separate the good from the bad yeah. as far as the men go. He talks about the sheep and the goats, not the fish, but right. he talks about the separation. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, the, mm -hmm. the, the thought of having to hate your life. I wish Jesus would have expounded on that a little bit more. I, I read the commentaries. I know what men explain it to mean. But I would... I would not want to try to explain that to someone I'm trying to win to Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to hate your life, brother, if you want to be a Christian. It, it's, uh, it's a tough, yeah. it's confusing. tough scripture. The, the contrast they're setting up is between love of God and love of your life. you got to love God more than you love your life. So the, the hate part, I'm not sure I'd use the word hate personally. I mean, the idea is love of God is paramount, not love of life. So you're saying that God is more important than our life. And yeah. So many people put our lives ahead of God. That, that's what he what he was right. saying here. Yeah. I've never read it that way. That's always confused me, John. I yeah. The the commentaries that I read, what he's saying here is, to you have to love God more than you love your own <laughs> life. And you know, later he talks about. If you love me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. So, again, it's love of God is more paramount than love of life. Which, if you'll think about the disciples in the early church, that was really true because how many of them are martyred? And even today, you look around the world, how many Christians have been killed because of their love of God more than their love of their own lives? You know, sometimes that's hard for us because we're not martyred. <clears throat> We have it easy compared to I many mean, places the rest of the world. We get very, I get very complacent, mm -hmm. okay? Maybe the rest of you don't. But I take it for granted that I can always come to church and I can always worship God. If I get busy doing something, you know, he'll forgive me if I mess up. And I think we, yeah, that's just, yeah. we need to be reminded. I remember five years ago when I went to Vietnam and Cambodia with mm -hmm. Pastor Mike and how there was one evening where we experienced late at night meeting with believers in a secluded area because they were afraid of persecution mm -hmm. from the government. So house, underground house church. Right. <clears throat> right. Well, that's just, I think that's probably a good idea because I, it's, to me it's just unimaginable. Well, yeah. about uh, what happens to people, <laughs> what the result of not doing what somebody else does. Yeah. Not obeying the government versus yeah, right. yeah. religion mm -hmm. or Christianity. We just don't have that. Fortunately, we don't have that. Yeah. Like I say, you know, I, I, we get the pathway every week, whatever it is, and there's always a little section in there that talks about different places in the world where... Christians have been killed or arrested or something else bad happened to them because of their faith. Well, the Middle East is a good example of that. Sorry? I said the Middle East is a good yeah. example of that. There are places in the Middle East, there are places in Africa, there are places in Asia. I mean, it's all over the place. We probably all get that paper. Yeah. <laughs> because it just, uh, you know, I don't worry about it a whole lot. I don't see any coming after me <coughs> or my family or anybody yeah. really you don't think about it until you see it in print and then it hits you Dean did you want to say something yeah to go back to my trip to Southeast Asia <coughs> we went up in the <coughs> mountainous area had to climb these trails to meet with this group of village people and uh, Mike got a phone call and they we had been transported up there on a bus, like we use here to transfer the seniors. And apparently, the I'll call them the police, I don't know what they were, but they had came and followed the bus up there and they were talking to the bus driver. And apparently he was asking them questions about 
what we were doing there and this type of stuff. So uh, we had to leave that area. Thankfully, uh, we were able to get back down to the bus and get on it and get back to our hotel. But, uh, you know, it's you know, sort of scary. It was scary. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. Well, they could have thrown you in jail right there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Shot you there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or take us out in, like she said, take us out in the jungle and nobody would know. Here we go. Yeah, that's even worse. So, okay, anybody else before we wrap it up? Yeah, Susan? I just got a message that Brother Don is going to take him to our Kansas City Hospital. Who? Weidman? Don Weidman? Yeah, Don Weidman. Oh. Okay. So we want to remember him in prayer. Yeah. So, Susan, why don't you close and do that? Okay. Right there with him. 